cool animation of the day, by the way. So, I found this utility, um, which runs a train across the screen every time you type SL instead of LS. Um, I changed that to change the coloring of the train, and then basically took a hodgepodge of everybody's SL programs and combined them all together, making this lovely, lovely graphic where every time the train moves, um, there's one more train added. You know, because this is like totally necessary. This is the filler content we've all been waiting for. <laughs> if there can be such a thing. But come on, it's it's beautiful. How could you not enjoy the train? Alright, so let me just catch up on my Discord stuff. Just in case I missed anything. And hopefully, uh, I think I've tested this. I'm able to terminate the script without having to log out. Uh, we'll find out. But I think I made it work. We will discover momentarily whether or not that is indeed the case, that the script can be terminated. Alright, so... Have I missed anything in my discords? Nope, nope, nope. Everything looks fine. There is no Discord among us here. So, let me pop out my chat window and full screen it, just in case somebody does happen to stop by and we want to talk about trains or something else. Because I don't know much about trains. Other than about this particular script. This is beautiful, is it not? Wow, that's a lot of trains. I forget what the maximum number of cars uh, of the train is, but um, there's one way to find out. And that would be looking at the code. Because in this case, running it, um, you can wait until the heat death of the universe and still not know um, the maximum number. But this is okay. That's a lot of cars. That's a lot of cars. Okay, so if I control C, that does stop it. Okay. <laughs> I'm laughing because of the message here. Um, you don't expect this kind of a message in a fortune cookie. At least I don't. Maybe you do. Maybe this message makes more sense to you than it makes to me. You will be held hostage by a radical group. Okay. That's our word of wisdom for the day. Alright, so... Welcome back. Uh, today we're going to look into this uh, table base probing code, which was recently augmented, enhanced, whatever, by the official Stockfish team. Um, in such a manner that what we, the multivariant Stockfish team, had written um, was kind of brittle and needs to be enhanced somehow. Theoretically, uh, this multivariant Stockfish has all these um, uh, preprocessor directives uh, where we're able to partition our code such that in the event that something completely goes haywire and we need to disable a variant um, to, for the sake of making all the other variants work, uh, we should be able to do that. Um, we've repeatedly tested such things and it seems to work pretty well. Although, honestly, it's these days uh, we use that more for debugging and troubleshooting than anything else. But the point is that um, we should be able, by disabling all this custom uh, 
per variant code. Um, we should be able to get a vanilla version of Stockfish uh, built and tested. And so the thing to test is this particular set of commands where we set the end game table base path and then just make sure that um, the number of nodes searched here matches the number of nodes that are searched by just vanilla stockfish um, which um, uh, that's not even the immediate goal well I'm sorry that's the that's the first goal. The second goal is that um, with and without this latest refactor of code, uh, we should see the same results. Um, the fact that upstream made a non-functional change should be reflected um, as a non-functional change in multivariant stockfish, um, and it wasn't. So I'm maintaining two branches of code, doing all kinds of experiments, trying to isolate the problem. Um, so my goals here are to, one, um, restore the functionality that I lost when merging the upstream changes, which just made this uh, endgame code considerably easier to consume and understand and such and should not have caused any kind of functional difference but somehow did. Two, future proofing this code as we just described. And three, um, making sure that I haven't lost any functionality. So it's, it's a really, really, really tall order. Um, the good news is that this is all reproducible. Uh, I've got all manner of test scripts and such in this directory. Um, not just for purposes of this particular issue, but just in general. I've been building up some command line tools for doing reproducible tests um, outside or absent of using some sort of third-party utility to automate said testing, which might also be a positive thing to do. I just haven't done it because I haven't. I found it easier to work with the command line so far. Um, than to set up third-party tools uh, which would require me to uh, have some way of checking files in. I mean, I mean, yes, I could do it, but... Well, no, it wouldn't require that, but I could also try to use a simple build tool um, and some sort of continuous integration with a text editor. But I'm doing this streaming from a Windows PC develop... Uh, uh, developing on a Linux server, so it's kind of a weird situation anyway. Um, there might be a way to do it, and there probably is. Uh, it's just, I don't know. I found that this workflow is acceptable, so I haven't had a need to change things considerably. Um, but yeah, we have some commands that we've built up from other scripts. We're able to run this at any time. This just says, based on our git history, this is the expected bench um, number of nodes searched result um, that's produced by the official upstream stockfish team. Um, that's not actually relevant to this test, but it doesn't hurt to leave that enabled. Here's a command for performing the actual stockfish build and for running stockfish. So when we run the script, uh, we run Stockfish, we observe, we see position 33 of 42, um, and then this just kind of cuts off, and you see there's all these other numbers that are dumped out, which I added uh, to the output to try to troubleshoot an issue that we're encountering. And the issue that we're encountering is that if you run Stockfish, you get a segmentation fault um, if you run it for this particular input, which should look familiar from the issue I posted on the GitHub description. The only difference here is that we're not searching at a depth of 22 half moves. We're searching at a depth of a single half move. 
and it still doesn't work. Um, one thing I've not yet done that I do need to do um, is compare with upstream stockfish to see what is the actual node count that is obtained by the upstream program. So absent a more constructive goal, that's apparently what I'm doing here. Um, so locally I've disabled all the variants um, and I've been commenting out or disabling more and more of this table-based probing code. Um, I did add this one comment, or not comment, I added this one uh, block of code that just prints out information, all these extra numbers that we're seeing. That's some diagnostic info that has no functional bearing, but could help me try to isolate the issue. Um, and that decompress pairs, this function is having um, an issue, or rather it's having a segmentation fault because we're trying to um, uh, index out of an array uh, using an index of net minus one, except we're doing this with an unsigned int, so it's really max int or whatever, but not that that matters. Um, it's still a segmentation fault because we're searching outside of the balance of the array. But it's not an array type, it's actually um, a malloced block of memory uh, for, because it's a sparse memory something or other for table base purposes. So it's kind of challenging to uh, look at what's going on here. But I've been partitioning this code more and more to try to identify uh, and isolate the root cause of this issue. Uh, I forget what's in my stash buffer, but let's stash our changes. Get check out upstream master. Make clean. Um, and uh, test. So this test should execute the same way for the upstream stockfish program as it does for multivariant stockfish. Um, take a minute to compile here. Even though I have it using multiple cores or queuing up multiple jobs at once, um, I do have other cores that are performing tests in the stockfish cluster. Um, namely our own multivariant fish test server. Um, okay, I guess that's fine. These are numbers. Let me move this file. Wait, does this tell me anything? Oh, I want to add the diagnostic information. Git stash apply. Git status. Uh, it's a lot of information. Uh, get checked out, make file, get diff. Wait. Yeah, I know make files unmerged. Oh, get reset head make file. Status. And then check out the plain old make file git diff. <sighs> git diff cached. Show me what I got here. All right, yeah, let's get this diagnostic information dumped while we're at it. Although I'm, this is dumping to standard error, I probably want this actually dumping to standard out. do that. Rerun the test with this patched code. Sorry about my cursor appearing over the SSH window. I keep forgetting that doing that's nothing but disruptive. Um, wait, do we not see an... okay, there we see in diagnostic info. Great. So if I say cat2.txt 
All right, let's move to that text over to one dot text. Get check. Uh, reset head everything. Get check out. All right, get check out master. Get stash apply. All right, and. So here, oh, I'm being silly. Why pick one or the other when I can pick both? That's a cleaner solution for my immediate needs. Um, well, OK. looks ugly as heck in the console, but um, alright, so this is multivariate stockfish with a lot of things commented out um, because I've disabled all the variant code, which now includes a good portion of um, the endgame table-based probing code. So um, yeah, we'll be able to figure out what's so different between um, versions. All right, there's our code terminating on position for uh, 33 of 42. Um, interesting that we don't get anywhere into 33, whereas previously we'd make at least some progress. I don't quite get what happened there. Unless there's a race condition or something. Um, all right. Um, So here's the two files. Um, oh, there's a number of things that are different. Uh, so <laughs> we're printing out a lot more information. I guess that's fine. Um, with equals 158 for this display, right? Um, so I think all these nodes X numbers are the same number of nodes, like 55 and 55. There's some timing information that's printed out here, too. I don't have a convenient way of stripping that out without writing an aux script to do it, and I don't feel like writing that. Um, so yeah, this... Uh, wait, selection depth, etc., etc. Nodes one, nodes one. Yeah, it's the same number of nodes. Um, so this here, two, three, six, three, five, it is a different index number than this number. So I should look into why I'm getting this index number. Like all these other diagnostic things matched up. It's just when we move to the next position here that we observed something different. Um, and then we have all this other information that got printed out successfully by upstream. It did not get printed out here because, um, well, because there's something that's substantially different. Um, so my thought is that with all the variant code disabled, that without some um, uh, without some I don't know motivation, there shouldn't be we shouldn't observe a different outcome here. Um, Let me 
add some code up here. Saying we should never end up with that hash key or index. Um, yeah, so this should be fine. Um, so here's our assertion. There's our additional debug code. I'm asserting that I should end up with the same index um, prior to invoking uh, the variant code. Why don't I also print out some more information? Uh, f print f to standard error. What position are we looking at? Um, Uh, prior to ending up with that uh, hash key. All right, so our position here is this position. Uh, do I have, yeah, I have an analysis board at the ready. Okay, so this is two kings, two knights. Obviously we know this to be drawn um, but less trivially, um, we still are looking this up inside the hash table, um, but getting a different index with which to perform the lookup than um, the vanilla stockfish code has. Uh, so what's so different about the code? Um, no. Uh, so what's so different about this code is that we have additional file extensions um, is that we have this additional parameter variant uh, what's different is that we count the number of unique pieces instead of just um, keeping track of whether or not there is a unique piece uh, unique being a white king, there's only one of it, or a black king, there's only one of it, or um, a piece and a color being unique. Um, there's min mode pieces, keeping track of the minimum mode of pieces per piece type, just in the bizarro event that you have a position where You've got two kings, um, well, I, um, I'll have to think more about that. That really has more to do with anti-chess, when you have all your pieces being of the same type, um, and you have all repeated pieces. There's some things which are done differently for anti-chess, but all that's essentially commented out for the sake of um, standard chess where you have each player has one king um, you don't have multiple kings so uh, there's nothing fancy that needs to be done there um, so here's our anti-chess code for keeping track of the minimum piece modality um, let's see I mean, there's nothing functionally different there. Um, oh, this triangle stuff really only applies to anti-chess. I should comment that out just to better isolate what the crap is going on here. Um, but yeah, you see the rest of this, all these constants are the same if you have all the variants disabled. Um, let's see, what else have we here? Insert. Oh, insert needs this parameter. Also, we're separating white pieces from black pieces so we can do more creative things with the uh, name of the table base um, 
because in anti-chess you can end up with one player having multiple kings. We need to differentiate which player has uh, the kings. Uh, if one player has one or more kings and the other does not. Um, whereas in standard chess, each player would have exactly one king. Okay, so... But that doesn't change anything functionally, it just changes the naming of um, the uh, files. Likewise, all this additional code down here. Uh, well, this first line just checks, does our variant have anything to do with table bases? Um, if not, um, don't try to insert a position into the table base. Uh, these are positions generated at, during runtime. I think there's only a handful of these positions, and I forget exactly why these are generated, but um, regardless. There's our diagnostic code. But yeah, all the rest of this should be the same. There is a function flip diag, which whose contents are exactly the same as uh, this expression. So I can leave that function be. Um, and there's all this anti-chess code, which ultimately terminates with else, and then the same as this block here. If we don't have at least three unique pieces, such as a king and two rooks versus a king and two bishops, uh, only map the kings. And that's still preserved throughout all of this. Um, there's some more diagnostic code. And then here, what's this? Um, is that functionally equivalent? If the player has pawns, the index um, needs to be multiplied. Else, if we have unique pieces, um, you multiply the index one way. Else, oh. Maybe I don't need or want that expression here, else if unique pieces are greater than or equal to 2. It shouldn't matter, because each player has exactly one king. There should not be any challenge there. Um, I should still rewrite or reformulate that for clarity's sake. Um, to say, else, if the variant is anti-chess, do the following. Else, do uh, fall back to multiplying by 462. Um, yeah, there's a lot of code there that could be simplified, but maybe that's the reason we're ending up with um, an index that we didn't expect here. Maybe this might be it. I'd have to add more diagnostic code to step through um, and see what specifically is different um, at various points in this hashing function. And I might as well do that, right? Code's not going to code itself. Um, but yeah, that's our this whole function here only some of which shows up in the diff, um, is our hash function for encoding a position uh, to a hash key. So it could be looked up in the table base. Um, hmm. It occurs to me, well, no. Now, regardless of the contents of the file, yeah, that shouldn't... I shouldn't need to regenerate the table bases. I should be able to use the same vanilla table bases that are used by upstream stockfish. That should not po uh, present any challenge. Still, it's a disquieting thought that I might have to use um, 
table bases that are different somehow. Uh, and then there's all our magic numbers. Per variant, we have all these magic numbers, although honestly, we don't need most of these because most variants don't have um, uh, table bases. So most of this is just a waste, unfortunately. Um, and then we have our ability to look up files based on a suffix. I have now uh, separated out this pawn list suffixes uh, array of arrays uh, to only be used for anti-chess because that's the only variant for which um, things are different in that regard and using a different magic value than use uh, the standard magic value. That confused me for the longest time because this pawnless TB magic does not appear upstream but appears in my repository and it took me forever to figure out that was something we added um, but now it's guarded by this um, uh, preprocessor directive if def so it's clear to me that this does not exist upstream and can be taken out without functional consequence um, yeah and then all this stuff is essentially commented out. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Um, result to score, etc. I think are only used by anti chess. I have to verify that. So there's all kinds of functionality here which is not executed by default because why would you be doing a search inside your table based probing code? I don't know. Presumably we had a good reason to do it. There's just so much code um, and um, at least now we're getting a handle on which lines of code correspond to something upstream um, and which exist only for variants and how do we isolate our variant code from um, what's done for standard chess. So I know that was me saying a lot of words. I know it didn't make any sense to anybody other than me and even to me. It, it, I'm still struggling with a great deal of this. but. I should not get, I should not fail this assertion, right? Um, I should not fail this one here. Uh, so let's find out if we do or not. Uh, yeah, we failed that assertion. We ended up with the index 23635. And so I should break up this. Um, function to figure out exactly where it is uh, at each point in the function what values do we have um, for this index. So that's going to be fun. Um, yeah, how do I divide this problem into smaller pieces? So, like, in standard chess, obviously you would never place a white king immediately adjacent to a black king, so the hashing scheme's a bit different for standard chess than it is for variants. Um, so, the fact that we have this extra variable called connected kings, which always evaluates to false, should not present any problem for standard chess. It's just a slight performance hit that um, can only be avoided with, at great code complexity. Or honestly, if I created a separate function um, and called it our kings connected or something, that would also address the complexity. Um, what was that other block of code? some helper functions and such. I was saying this one function flip diag can stay 
but the rest of these functions and the usage of this triangle um, should only be isolated to um, uh, anti-chess. Where do we end up using this triangle? Here we do. If we have atomic or anti-chess, I don't know exactly why, but we have our own hashing scheme for those two variants for some kind of special functionality, um, which is great, but we just don't need any of this um, for standard chess. Map PP, I don't even know what, yeah, like this multi twist and all this stuff, I don't know what it's for. Um, I'm sure it's all great and wonderful and cool and stuff. I just don't think that it's necessary for um, for all variants, or at least not for standard chess. All right, so I've effectively commented out those uh, things, which I expect is going to cause my compilation to fail. So let's. See, can I compile without trying to run anything? Nope. Our first error is at line 2118. Um, that's weird. This is where if I were using a proper IDE, we would see things resolve a lot faster. Um, we do have a line number Unquestionably, what this means is that, um, yeah, I just put my end if uh, before a brace instead of after it. So let's try compiling this again. No way. Really? So I could have commented all that stuff out earlier. Um, without any kind of problem. Okay, let's run the full script. Yeah, of course our assertion still fails even without all, with all those constants commented out. Um, is there anything else here which can go? I don't think so. Um, I think most of these things um, are utilized by all standard chess. Map B1. Uh, yeah, that's used by standard chess. Um, okay, so all those really complicated tables don't pertain at all to what we're doing. And furthermore, aren't even referenced in the initialization function. Or if they are, it's in, they're in that block of the initialization function that we just commented out. But I didn't see them there. Like this multi or mult idx. I don't know what that's for. Um, and I didn't see that getting initialized anywhere. Oh, okay. So all these things are initialized together. That's kind of cool. Um, is this binomial stuff used anywhere? Uh, okay. It's used all over the place. So I guess I've commented out all the um, constants that don't pertain to what I'm doing, I guess, unless there's more constants that I'm unaware of. Uh, okay. So what 
else? Uh, is there anything else I can essentially comment out here? Or is that as far as we're gonna go? Huh, so for Win32, different things are done for memory mapping and unmapping. Okay, good to know, I guess. Um, okay, so... This is the decompression function. We, we're not going to get that far because this only gets invoked after we've created the index. Um, there's code for mapping and scoring values, I guess. I didn't touch any of this, so I'd be shocked if it somehow functioned uh, in a non-standard manner. Um, the initialization routine um, was not modified for multivariate stockfish, other than that block of the initialization code, which uh, touches the new arrays. Um, there's nothing that changes the values in the existing arrays, as far as I'm aware. So, yeah, I didn't touch any of this stuff. It's all complicated and anyway. Um, so what's the deal here? Uh, I said only execute this code. One, if we have these variants enabled. Two, if our variant is a non-standard chess variant. And three, if some other conditions are met. Um, otherwise, we just fall back to the standard stuff down here. Um, okay, and now what? I mean, our assertion's right down here, so... Yeah, at this point, I should figure out... Um, remaining pawns. Well, we're not, we don't have any remaining pawns here, but um, we could introspect what's the value of index um, prior to doing, well, prior to doing this while loop here. Uh, that's not what I was aiming to do. So, actually, yeah, let's put this before the while loop. Let's put this before um, the reassignment here. And we just we could pepper all this code with this kind of stuff. Um, where's the multiple? The index multiplier code that I was talking about earlier. If our entry has pawns, do stuff one way. Um, hmm. No, I happen to know this entire function executes. Um, we're not checking just, well, I don't even know what we're checking when we fail. That would be a good thing to know. Although it shouldn't affect our indexing function. Uh, I happen to know that this function runs through to the very end in the final return statement, which in turn calls decompress pairs. Um, P A I R S, not the fruit. Um, so. Uh, and like I said, I don't think any of this uh, lead pawn index stuff has changed. Not that that matters in this case, because our test position doesn't have any pawns in it. Um, and none of these lines of code have changed from the vanilla stockfish. This here, entry num unique pieces, um, has changed.
upstream only checks, uh, only assigns this variable um, if there are uh, unique pieces other than the kings. Uh, here we keep track of the count of uh, how many unique pieces there are, up to 12, uh, being a white pawn if there's only one, a white knight if there's only one, etc. This is functionally equivalent. Uh, that's a good thing to check. But yeah, all this index multiplier code stuff is the same. None of this is getting executed in our test position, however, which has a white king, a black king, and two knights, which are not unique. They're both the same color. So all that gets skipped, all this gets skipped. This block of code does execute, assigns false to connected kings, which in turn skips this if connected kings code. So we just end up calling this directly, uh, which accesses the value in the array. I couldn't have possibly messed this up. I say, with such extreme confidence. Um, and then, so, after having done the IDX assignment, then we multiply by group IDX, because that's something this function's always done. And then, um, like, all this stuff I've not changed. So, whatever. Yeah, let's just run this and see where we end up. Oh, I forgot my other data point here was that the previous test position, some of these intermediate numbers differed quite a bit. Um, I should take a closer look at how those differed. Uh, so, the last step of this was to compare the files after they were executed. This is a useful command, not the whole thing, just this last line is a useful command regardless. So let's execute that, and then we can see um, wait, what? All these intermediate numbers are the same now. I didn't functionally change anything. How come these are matching up better than they used to? What have I done? Okay, I guess I'll accept that, because I don't... You remember that like all these intermediate numbers and this big block of numbers, like half of these mismatch uh, the official numbers. But now there is no mismatch. At least not until the program abruptly terminates. And we all know the reason for its termination, but, um, that's weird. Okay, so... Hmm, great. Um, this is not a functional change. It's triangle and such. I, I say it with great fun. Um, anyway, so... Our assertion failed um, as the key point, and I guess that's why this difference commented out is that our script terminates. Um, okay, so here's our position. Um, well, I want to have additional. T oh, here we are. Just this one uh, set of numbers gets printed. That's not what I was expecting. Um, where's my source code? Um, standard out. Okay, let's dump that all the standard error instead. 
and recompile and rerun this and see what numbers we get this time. Um, okay. So, why didn't I get the same? Hmm. Um, I'm confused. So we should have seen this print out. Oh, this prints out just the position. I forgot to print out the index. That explains um, garbage in, garbage out. Explains it. So, yeah, if I want to get the actual index, I have to write this to print out the value of index. Um, and, yeah, let's print that out once more. Okay, let's get the index value. <laughs> Except it's a long unsigned, not a... Uh, not a decimal. So, yeah, let's encode that as a long unsigned, as a long unsigned. I'm not sure this is going to have any functional bearing because uh, fprintf, uh, the GNU compiler, and the header files and such do format things pretty well, but they do better if you inform uh, those. Uh, okay, so two, three, six, three, five. Um, but yeah, I was going to say that the libraries and such do a good job formatting your arguments, even if there are warnings um, for nominal values. Uh, the compiler does a reasonable thing anyway. Oh, I'm sorry, the library that. Um, prints out values um, will do things like taking your unsigned integer and print it as an integer without any problem other than the compiler warning you that uh, for extreme values that uh, things might not get printed out correctly but okay here we are 23635 is set and then never changed um, and I was saying when I was code reviewing this that um, I didn't change any of this stuff up here. So this map kk value based on this map, all this indexing into the, all these tables should produce the same number as upstream, though I should verify that. but. If I added the same line of code to print out a value upstream, we should still see the same thing. Uh, let's dump all these things to standard out, just for cleanliness sake. So that when we print out the, when we produce this uh, text file containing standard out but not containing standard error, that these numbers should be put in that, inside that text file. Um, yeah, so here, it's the only thing that's slightly ugly about printing the standard out is uh, that our error appears sandwiched in the middle of this. That's okay. Um, so if I go cat uh, 2.txt, yeah, we have all our information printed here. And I want to see if these numbers would match up with what are what are generated by the vanilla stockfish. Um, stash clear. Um, is there anything in here that I don't want transferred? Oh, this uh, if defined atomic and stuff. Right. Um, yeah, that's not going to transfer very well. Okay. Um, 
can do without some of this debugging code anyway. Namely, this block of code here, which predicts gloom and doom, um, you know, based on your offset being less than zero. Um, I don't need that right now. Um, likewise, I want to check in. Um, this is my changes that disabled. Uh, let's see. I want to check in this stuff um, that changed tbprobe.cpp. put our diagnostic code back in. So what do I want to describe this as? Um, git log. Wait, what happened here? I'm confused. Have I not committed additional things locally that have, anyway. Oh, that's right. Yesterday, I merged one more thing from upstream. I was looking for these commit messages, though. Um, right, so I want a message that looks like that. Um, separate anti chess table base encoding. Um, what do I call this? Um, it's not metadata. Generated tables. Um, uh, that's not accurate either. Um, what do you call uh, just a table of constants? Um, I guess constants. No functional change here again. <sighs> um, before I push that, I should verify that I've not broken anything, which I can do here using the script that we use. Um, this is the script that's used by Travis. And now that I'm starting to use, to verify that the benchmark numbers are indeed identical. Um, hey, what we're working on um, is trying to fix something pretty complex in this chess engine. Um, so there's the Stockfish chess engine um, many chess players have heard of. I maintain a fork of this engine that is capable of playing all kinds of crazy chess variants. Periodically I update my fork with changes from upstream and um, this causes all kinds of havoc when um, things don't merge properly. So I'm using this script here to verify that I've indeed merged things properly. Uh, Let's see. Get status. Get stash clear. Get stash all my local changes. Make clean. And then we're going to run this to verify that we end up with the same benchmark number as the upstream repository for a suite of test positions. Um, just to make sure that my latest change here doesn't break anything. Um, I'm going to run it two different ways. One is with all this variant code enabled, um, which actually should trivially pass. That should not be any problem. Two would be um, if I disable all the variant code and I execute the same test, do I still end up with the same number? Again, that should work. 
Yeah, I don't know why I'm even conducting this test. This test can only pass. Um, because all I did was just add preprocessor directives to separate um, code based on which chess variants are enabled at compile time. That should not present any challenges here. So this test must pass, and then if I disable all the variants, that test should pass too. And then I'll push my change and then um, switch contexts here and add some debugging code um, to uh, the official Stockfish repository, see what numbers are produced by the debugging code, and then switch back to this engine and see what numbers it produces. Signature OK, test successful, cool. Um, so then if I go to my make file, and I disable all the chess variants, make clean, and recompile and retest everything. With the updated make file, yes, we do get warnings, and that's OK, as long as we get the same benchmark number. Um, how many months of learning programming did it take you before contributing in GitHub? Um, hmm. Contributing in GitHub. Like, I'm just using GitHub just to back up my changes and I guess to distribute them. Um, I don't know, I've had, I've been encouraging people to submit patches to this engine just if they have any ideas, if they can write like even a single line of code and write something that compiles um, and if they can figure out how to use Git or even use the web interface to submit a patch. Um, I've been encouraging people to do that. Um, instead people write like these multi-paragraph explanations of you gotta change this one line of code and then you change it and then they tell you no you did it wrong and it's like well, if you had this idea, couldn't you submit the patch yourself? But anyway, okay, we got the same benchmark number here. So, uh, so this patch is safe and good to go. Really, that's a non-functional patch anyway. Um, to a block of code that's not um, touched very often. Uh, or that's not executed ever, um, basically. Otherwise, I'd be more rigorous about testing that. Um, okay, so, but yeah, your question is how much do you have to code before you're able to contribute at all? I'd say the barrier to entry is pretty low. Um, I would have been using this much sooner if I um, realized that people on GitHub were so useful at correcting or commenting or whatever on your changes. Um, it's like um, GitHub is a place where you can back up your code. Um, rather, just using any kind of version control is a good practice for anybody who's doing any programming whatsoever. Whether or not you choose to publish the changes, although if it's just for fun, why wouldn't you publish them? Uh, I don't need this instrumentation. I don't need to verify that the upstream code produces the same benchmark number as the upstream code because we know it does. Um, let's try running this with all the additional debugging code added. Or I'm not sure what you call it. Profiling code? Something that just prints out additional um, output into a text file. I've never come up with, uh, I've heard 
people call some things like instrumentation code, but that's really only for uh, profile guided optimization and such. This is just dumping more information to a log file. Uh, namely, now we have all these extra numbers that are dumped to the log file in addition to um, the position itself. Here's the index. Um, so that's cool. It's a lot of output. All right, so let's move that to one dot text. Uh, hit check out master. Hit stash apply the same code. This does print to standard out, not standard error, right? Yes. Oh, hang on. Um, I messed up. I messed up. There was one more thing I was going to do here. Um, yeah, so reset our make file and um, what I was intending to do here uh, is print out even more wait am I looking at the right file uh, stash fly Here's my debugging code. Uh, I'm just going to add more of that earlier up in this function. Let's see. So, where do we do all kinds of assignments to this variable idx? Uh, so, idx, if we have pawns, execute this. But my test position doesn't have pawns, so I'm not really interested in this. Um, else do an assignment this way, else, etc. So, yeah, let's dump this yeah, encode remaining. Where else do we change this value of idx? We change it here. Um, so, yeah, let's print this up before our while loop, and then after our while loop. And I think that's informative enough. For it to be consistent, let's print this out every time we manipulate this value of idx after the initial assignment. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Didn't realize it was just, I added a redundant printing statement. Um, okay, so we want the initial assigned value. This gets multiplied by another value. Uh, we want to print this out again. And then after our while loop, we print this out one more time. Um, let's try that. Um, but yeah, I've seen people contribute other interesting projects to GitHub too. Even people that don't necessarily have the strongest programming background or software development background um, can still do some very interesting projects. Though it takes them considerably more effort, particularly if they don't reach out to other people for help. Um, I'm not sure where you'd go for help though, honestly. Like publishing the code in GitHub, if you publish something with interesting keywords, um, you can maybe attract attention from like-minded individuals. But I'm not sure that that's a guarantee for getting assistance. And I'm not sure where you would go online to be guaranteed to get assistance from other people. All right, so here, yeah, we have a lot more 
numbers being dumped. Um, status. Whoa, I forgot. Anyway, um, what's this? Modified. All right, get stash. Get check out master of my own repository. Get stash apply. Get make file. Disable all our variants again. Um, move two to one so I don't lose all that beautiful data. And this is going to rerun the test and get all these intermediate numbers printed out. We'll see how many of these match up. So, yeah, by all means, people don't have to do the kind of really intensely, ridiculously complex coding stuff that I'm doing here. Um, I just do it because I both have a passion for chess and a passion for software development with other people who understand what we can do with software. And I think this is a great tool to help people learn chess through learning chess variants. Um, strange as that is. And a great many people benefit from this, so I don't mind putting in a little bit of effort to try to make this work. Um, okay, so the last line of this script compares the two text files. Uh, obviously there's some differences here after the program terminated abruptly. Um, oh, so all these numbers about how we generate the index are apparently the same in a great many cases, um, except for this position where apparently we should have ended up with the number 341 instead of 23635. And then other stuff should have happened here. Um, but okay, that's uh, this allows me to, in turn, um, where is it? Where's my command to edit the file? Here it is. Um, in turn, I can take this assertion and add it to these other uh, scopes. And we should see the program asserts earlier that we're not getting the expected value of 341. So, yeah. Admittedly, there is some risk to me adding these assertions there might be a legitimate path through the code executed somewhere earlier in the test where we did expect this 23635 number, um, in which case I'd have to fix this assertion to, say, for this particular test position, generate index 341. Here I'm being a bit lazy at just saying, just never allow this index to be generated. Um, all right, so. And it's through this very tedious process that I'm able to figure out um, where it is that we got the wrong number. Um, I'm going to make a guess here um, that it's this line of code which is producing that number. Yep, good old lazy coding. You know, instead of using like a proper IDE or whatever, I still have to figure out how from Windows, how best to use an IDE that has all these testing things built into it, that integrates with the stock fish bank file. I just, it would be some kind of hodgepodge that does some sort of, I don't know, weird file sharing something or other. Um... I'm not sure how I'd get this to work from this hybrid Windows Linux environment and still running. Uh, I know there's ways to make 
editors do smart things. But um, I, I'm completely blanking on all these names of tools um, for Emacs and for Vim and such that will automatically rerun tests in the background. But there are ways to do it. Um, but I'm not doing nearly the, the volume of development that would justify such a switch, I don't think. Um, just given how difficult I think such a switch might be. So, um, so did I guess correctly? How do I even know? I should have been smarter and what I did here. Um, and just like pen this with some random string so I can see if that's really what's getting executed. Yeah, I expect it's fairly messy, but there are ways to do it. So the question is, does that ASDF string appear at all in here? Apparently not. Apparently we don't see that. Uh, like, I don't see ASDF here at all. That's so. I was predicting that we take one path through the code that ended up here. That's really not where we ended up. Um, really, what I should print out instead of this babble here would be. What are the values of all the parameters that are considered in these evaluations? Like entry num unique pieces. Let's print that out. Um, before we start falling into any of these things. So that's just an unsigned integer. Uh, Go back up here. Um, that'll make it stand out a bit more. And let's see what number we end up with this time. Three. Three unique pieces, we're saying. In this position, where white has a king, black has a king, white has two knights. Our num unique pieces is three. That does not make sense to me. Um, what populates that? For piece type, count the number of pieces for that given color in piece type. If that count is exactly equal to one, print out, or rather, increment the value of this variable. Um, I would fully expect, for, for my position where white has a pair of knights and each player has a king, we should end up with two unique pieces. The white king, the black king that this knight pair should not count as a unique piece. Um, so, is there anything else that sets or increments that value? Or is there just a bug in my data that I'm working with? Um, Okay, just to illustrate something for a second. Um, position FEN this thing. This is what our position looks like. There's a king, there's a king, there's two knights. Um, so, I would fully expect this to have two unique pieces not three. Uh, 
I mean, yeah, I could check the upstream code and see what it does. <sighs> Although the upstream code doesn't keep track of a count, it just checks, does my position indeed have unique pieces? Um, hmm. Okay. Well, okay, there's ways to troubleshoot what's going on here. Um, this is the only thing that increments that value, so if we start from that premise, uh, if one and if, I add this pre-processing code um, just to help me keep track of the things. Oh, so I can both enable and disable it quickly during debugging and keep track of all the things I have to remove before I actually commit and push to GitHub. Um, so, print out... Um, doesn't really matter if it's standard out or standard error. Uh, so we want color, piece type, um, and then the position. Um, or rather, let's print out, well, no. We'll know from how many times this, no, we won't. We don't know how many times we ended up inside this function, so, okay, here we go. Um, actually, here we go, count. Yeah, I should take this out of the loop and just print out the count value, um, color, piece type, and do we have the position POS itself? Yes, POS.FEN to string, there we go, and that's only going to slightly clutter my output in a very ridiculous way. Alright, so Wait, what? Shouldn't I have not seen like a lot of more information get dumped here? Um, did my program fail to compile? No, it compiled just fine. It did run, so... Um, I'm confused. I thought that block of code was what initialized this num unique pieces counter. Um, apparently, I'm mistaken. Well, this is for win, draw, some win, loss, and draw um, searches. That's what initializes that value. There might be another way that gets initialized. Um, so where would that be? Um, that doesn't, that's not initialization. Okay. Um, yeah. There's only one initialization there. I'm so confused. Um. <sighs> Something's not quite right. Oh, so we don't need this. Make clean. Make clean with spelling it correctly. It doesn't make sense that I don't see that getting initialized. Oh, okay, here we go. There was a compiler error. Where was that? 
At least I thought that was an error. I thought I saw something in red text as opposed to purple. No, these are just warnings. Okay, sorry about my confusion here. I was just scrolling up and down while this was compiling, because, um, why not? So, okay, um, Maybe if I print this to standard error instead, something will work better? I don't know. I'm not sure why that didn't print. Or maybe I, I forgot to add a, char uh, a new line character at the end of this. No, I didn't. We've got a new line. Let's add a few more new lines. I'll make it really stand out where this is at. Assuming anything is getting printed at all. Okay. Here we are. Found it. So, okay. So we have um, our last position. Uh, let's see. So this is pawn. No pawns, no white knights, no white bishops, no white queens. 305. I'm sorry, those there's three white queens in that position. Where did my debugging for my latest position go though? I don't see it here anywhere. Um, maybe this is just used, yeah, I'm confused. I am so confused. Num unique pieces gets incremented here. Um, Somehow, something is assigning a value to that variable, and I'm not finding what's doing that. Because you'd think that if this routine were doing the assignment, um, that'd be pretty obvious. so confused. Okay, let me do one more thing. Um, I'm going to take the set of all the benchmark positions and skip about 30 of these. Um, so we're at line 39. Let's go to line 69 here. skip over most of the tests because those aren't the ones causing the problem. Okay, so something apparently recompiled or functions differently now because we saw something different getting printed here. Um, again, I'm not sure what's with that all these kings and multiple queen positions. I think some of these are automatically generated by Stockfish. But I don't see my test position among any of these. Um, it could be that the table base entry I'm looking at is doing something curious. Uh, so. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Let me disable some of my output for 
um, all these other things we're printing. Uh, sure, let's disable these things. This, no, we can leave this last one in here. Because otherwise we're going to get a segmentation fault anyway. So, all right, so what do we got this time? Found 145 table bases, and I'm not sure why we have so many things being printed there here. Um, now where's... I thought this was going to say position 1 of 2, position 2 of 2, etc. I don't see that getting printed here anywhere either. That's very strange. I think it's just haunted, guys. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, fine. Just allow the segmentation fault to happen. That's okay. We should still get output. Um. Yeah, position 3 of 12, and then just nothing. Um, let's try that. Printing the standard error instead of standard out. Um, still nothing. How... Okay, maybe this is the key difference somewhere, is that somehow I'm failing to execute this routine. But how? Like... How could this not get executed? And the program not just be completely failing for in the most ridiculous possible fashion. I don't get it. Like, I... Okay. Let's print out something else up here then. Um... I don't know, let's print out... a uh, piece count. How many pieces are in a given position? Nothing too special there. I should get that much back, no? Twelve. Oh, I'm sorry, this is position three of best move C1A2, twelve. Um... Let's try to take this test script. Um, just run this standalone. Okay, that didn't make any difference. Whether or not I had standard in being forwarded to the program, um, it still prints out the same output. I'm so confused. Like, for each of these, we should see all this debugging information somehow get dumped. fprintf, printing to standard error, the value of this expression, which has multiple new line characters in it, 
We don't really need all these gratuitous new lines. But I should see um, fairly obviously. Unless we're not trying to do this kind of search or something. I don't know. Um, so, okay, let me back up, because I started pretty deep down in the woods here. I need to extract myself all the way out of the trenches, back up to the top of the stack. Um, so what we're trying to do is look up a chest position inside a table base. How the fuck does this code do that? Evidently not by creating a TB entry and then seeing if the TB entry exists. Um, evidently there's some other mechanism for performing the lookup. And that lookup finds this value in the table base, which has num unique pieces set to three, despite the fact that there are four pieces, two of which are non-unique in this position. Um, so, there's stuff for inserting values into the table base. That's not what we're doing. We are attempting to probe the table base. Uh, looking for a particular position. Um, do probe table. Alright, how does this work again? Uh, entry, where does entry come from? Do probe table, TB entry, entry. I'm so confused what that means here. Um, <laughs> so, somehow we've already probed and are trying to process the entry. I need to figure out how we're doing the probing in the first place. This initializes the table base. Um, <laughs> okay. I don't know exactly what this is for. The purpose of this might just be to initialize the tables that are needed elsewhere, else when, for um, reading and encoding and decoding and stuff. Um, got more magic tables here. Um, if data, if there is a data file, do in it, and then return e.base address, I guess is the first TB entry, first pointer in the table. Probe table. Um, okay. Entry table get for material key. This is where the lookup happens. Um, so I should look up. And then we try to process the entry that we found. Assuming we did find one. Alright. So material key shouldn't do anything too fancy and probably isn't that helpful either.
Right, so there's a value. Um, position.cpp, which is just initialized based on yeah your Zobrist hash tables. So that makes sense. So that value that's the number of unique positions is incorrect in my data file. I don't know how else to explain it. Um, Cause yeah, we're not initializing that value. So I guess that means that my data file contains bad values or I'm just not accessing it correctly. Um, yeah, so we're not generating a TB entry. There are some TB entries which are generated um, at the start of the program because it's easier, um, well, because they're low cost to generate. Um, but yeah, this num unique pieces. Um, in the entry is not at all what I'd expected it to be. Um, so that leaves me very confused with how to continue approaching this. Because, yeah, we have a unique piece count of three even though um, it's pretty clear that our position that we're dealing with has two knights, neither of which are unique. And there's a comment later on down here that says if you have like king and two rooks versus king and two bishops, we don't have at least three unique pieces. And in that context, I would not call our two white knights unique pieces. I would call the white king and a black king unique, but I wouldn't call our two knights unique here. So... Um... Okay. I'm very confused. We've looked up our entry using our material key. Um, which reflects the total values of all the pieces involved. So I'm I'm very confused. What was the file in which we looked up this? Um, king and two knights versus king. Let me start focusing on the data files instead of the source code at this point, because this isn't a hard problem. Um, um, it's none of these five-man table bases here. I don't have any five mans, do I? King, queen, rook versus king, knight. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, dot star. These are all my five man table bases. I don't need any of these to reproduce the problem I'm currently having. Right? I have extra copies of these lying around, so. Here we've got yeah four man table bases. Um, and just to verify, uh, yep, 
that is our path that we're operating on. So if I rerun the test, I should see the same problem. No, I do not. Um, okay. So if I have five-man table bases installed, this four-man position has a problem. That's not good. Fuck. Okay, so what now? Um, why am I getting this crisscross between my five-man and four-man table bases? How is this something variant related? Do I need to regenerate my table bases based on something I've done? Okay, wait. This entry num unique pieces. What printed out this time? Before I get too deep into the woods here. Nothing printed out. Why did nothing print out? What what's going on here? So we used to get to position three and then have an error. Um So, where is the position that has all the knights in it? Um, yes, these do start as five-man positions, after all. Um, there was a uh, king and two knights, right? First a king and a pawn. This what this must be. Um, I'm trying to visualize what each of these are, because I'm being silly. Um, so here's one with the knight and a knight. That's an eight, not a bishop. All right. Um, and both players have pawns. So it's this position here. That has two knights in it. Um, and no bishops or other things. So this is the one that's been giving us all the grief, but that starts as a five-man position. But what's happening is that Stockfish is searching. Um, I'm confused. The stockfish not use the table bases unless uh, I, I would have expected stockfish to search, hit something in the table base, and keep going or something. Um, but I only told it to search uh, one move deep, but I would have expected it to do a table base lookup at the end of that one move. Let's try something a little saner, shall we? Um, instead of searching one move deep, let's restore this bit of the test. Uh, it's a lot more information. I'm just trying to identify if something fails here or not. <laughs> that last position <laughs> doesn't even consult the table base. Like, all the rest of this uses the table bases, though. So, Apparently, the program only craps out, searching at depth 22, if I have five-man table bases installed. Is there some conflict somehow between my four-man and five-man table bases? Because the rest of this executes perfectly for... Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on here. Um, let's try something a little less sane than this. What happens if I say do a multi-threaded search? Two threads. Can I get things to crap out? I don't think so. 
yeah, that still executes and terminates as expected. Um, I I don't know. I'm at a loss as to why this works if I only have four man table bases installed. Um, what are all my parameters I have to select among? Um, um, I guess this is a G probe limit, something I can set to indicate that I have four man table bases installed. Um, don't know why I'd have to set that, but uh, value four. Oops. And if we try this again. Okay. Um, now if I set the pro limit to four, but I've uh, thrown in, oh, where is, is it fishnet? Is that where I have all my table bases? Uh, TB, RTB question mark. All right. Six letters means a five man table base. Uh, link all these things into TB. SRT uh, and T. Well, LSTB. Um, See, I now have added in all my five man table bases here, right? Yep. Okay, that's cool. Uh, so, what if I have all the table bases installed and I set the pro limit to four? I see no problem. What if then I go back to this and say probe the table bases for five man positions? Um. Okay, then the problem occurs. So, setting the probe limit to four is a workaround. Uh, nobody added comments to this, right? Set uh, work around set to four. So now the simplest, shortest, whatever most concise example is, um, I did spell that right, SSCC, uh, short, self-contained, correct example. stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not sure how to take this much farther. One step is that I might need to regenerate the table bases. Um, I find it very surprising that setting this parameter to four completely fixes the search. Uh, let me... I terminated that. That was me terminating it. Um, let's re-enable all the benchmark positions. Um, 
and re-enable the table base or comment out all my custom extra printing code. Um, recompile and verify that setting that parameter to four actually works around the problem um, at depth 22. Um, well, actually, before we do that, let's try this entire uh, test suite at depth 1. Depth 1 works. All right. Let's try this at depth 8 for all positions. Um, that's not good. So there's another problem here. Uh, terminates on position 33 anyway. Um, how about depth 4? Depth 4 completes. Uh, how about depth 6? Okay, how about depth 5? Uh, yeah, depth 5 completes. Um, for a maximum search depth of five. Okay, so um, not sure why five is the. Or I'm sure not. Sorry, not sure why searching at depth six makes any difference here. But apparently it does. Apparently at depth six, something interesting happens in that position. Um, presumably a capture occurs, and that capture puts us into the table base in some kind of weird way. Um, but I don't find it too interesting. Well, rather, I find it more interesting that we have a problem at depth one then we have a depth problem at depth five because at depth five, who knows what happened? Um, at depth one, we should have a pretty good idea what's going on. Um, and to further clarify, these problems still persist even if I comment out most of these test positions, right? The fact that we have all these test positions in series isn't itself the problem. Um, it's that. Wait, what? That doesn't make sense either. Okay. Well, that's great. Um. So yeah, searching all those positions in series actually does cause the problem. Searching any one individual position appears not to be problematic until maybe, I don't know, until maybe we're doing something in a transposition table and shit hits the fan. I can't tell. I guess the way to tell would be to take these test positions and reintroduce them some number of these at a time and see um, when does our problem resurface? Okay, we have a problem in this case. What if I take this and comment out, I don't know, some of these positions? How many of these do I have to execute for there to be a problem? Okay, there's a problem there. How about this many? Okay, how about this many? Yeah. So the fact that I search something that's not in the table base, and then I end up searching positions that are in the table base, presents an issue. Um, does it matter what my value of 
um, probe limit is. If I reduce this to 3, do I still have problems? No. Um, so having this at a probe limit of 4, searching at a depth of 6 is problematic. Okay. Well, that is surprising. Um, yeah, I'm very confused at this point. I'm trying to take this enormous problem and break it down into smaller pieces, or decompose it. Um, and I'm having problems. Um, so... Let's see. Alternatively, comment out the first 25-ish positions in benchmark.cpp and do the following. And that should be problematic too. Um, uh, let's see. But not in this particular position. following it. Um, I guess those aren't positions, those are actually bend strings to be more precise. Alright, well, you know, the only reason I haven't assigned this to myself is because I still don't understand it. I'm afraid to assign this to myself because um, Somebody else might have a better shot at figuring this out than I do. I don't know. I've been babbling the whole time. Thanks for bearing with me. Uh, if anything, I hope this has helped some people um, get to sleep or something. Or just relax or whatever. I know it's not the best ASMR ever, but, you know, uh, we had some fun here together. I honestly, uh, yeah, uh, I honestly think that probably most people have tuned out by now, and that's probably best for everybody. Um, I'm going to have to leave that there, so for what that's worth, today I just commented out all these constants, and that appeared, although this gives us greater control over being able to deploy stockfish and disable stuff that never or that could only cause problems and um, has very few benefits from actually executing um, yeah I, I don't know so this all started with um, me trying to merge changes which improved the upstream repository by heavily refactoring the table-based probing code which has been a point of some contention for a number of release cycles now as developers disagree upon the best way to do all this table base code um, with unfortunately the maintainer taking some positions about um, well I don't even understand that either but there's just been so much argument and uh, between the maintainer and some developers that uh, they're finally taking some steps to change some of this code and I don't know if it's all in agreement or disagreement or whatever there hasn't been very much contact with um, the original developer as far as I see um, and I don't know why but 
I do appreciate that that developer is uh, now working on trying to do some table-based stuff in Rust. Um, well, doing Stockfish in Rust, honestly. Um, I appreciate that he's uh, done something productive there. Um, because the argument that was going back and forth um, just was very confusing to all of us, I think. Uh, I'm not sure why I'm actually inclined to side with the developer there, because I don't understand the points that the other people were making. Um, but anyway, yeah, they've started to do chess in Rust, which is very exciting. And I don't know if they're going to try to keep up with the latest um, Stockfish development, or I don't know why it was that they ported Stockfish to Rust in the first place. Um, but anyway, all these changes that took place upstream here to try to refactor this table-based probing code, I guess seem reasonable. I don't know. I never really tried to evaluate their reasonableness, but... Um, the way in which they were coded and the way in which I coded my variant uh, table-based code had all these conflicts um, which required me to try to resolve the conflict somehow. And in so trying to resolve things, um, things broke. It just caused me to take a much deeper look at all this table-based stuff um, and try to break it into smaller pieces and figure out what's the same and what's different as compared to upstream. And um, I still haven't been able to isolate that. Um, it could very well be that the table bases I generated or downloaded, I forget now, but it could be that they contain errors um, for very uncommon positions, but Positions which are exercised, well, no. No. I was going to say that all these table-based stuff is exercised um, from the test suite that regularly runs on AppVair. Or that at least the test suite that we've been using for our, our regression testing. We've been heavily relying on the set of positions that are in uh, benchmark.cpp, but we've not been exercising those using the table base. So it's altogether possible that maybe for a year or two years or however long now, our table base code has been um, incompatible with the Stockfish, vanilla Stockfish table base format. Uh, that is, the ZZG bases might be incompatible um, with my repository. And I'm, that doesn't make sense, but, um, how else do I process this? Just let me confirm one more time. Um, get checked out. Not to keep us here too much longer, but um, let's clear my stash buffer, get stash my changes, get check out upstream master clean and just verify once more that we have no problem searching all of our test positions at depth 6 using just plain old stockfish. It's just my master branch that has a problem. The official repository could not possibly have any problem doing this kind of search. Um, Yeah, so that completes without errors, unsurprisingly, which 
I'm not sure. Did this find any table bases? Because my table bases have different names than the. Um, yeah, this found 145 table bases. But. The official stockfish looks for them by different names. Just because there are that many files inside the directory doesn't mean that they all have the same name as what you'd expect. Um, okay, so how do I... Like, all these that have a V in them typically would not have this... Can I say that? Am I sure? Um, king, queen, king, dot, r, t, b, win, draw, loss. Whoops. I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do locate. Does this file exist by that? No? Okay. But king, queen versus king. Okay, that's confusing. Why does that... Did I typo? Yeah, this should be rtbw. Of course that file exists all over the place. Does the one without the letter v exist? No. Okay, so... It's not like the file names are any different. It's just that if we had table bases for variants, um, they could have more interesting... You could have both, both kings be on one side of the V or the other side of the V or something um, for variants. So I guess that's why my naming convention slightly differs, but um, yeah, Stockfish has no problem using these table bases. Um, so, uh, let's try applying this stash. Or, um, get reset head this stuff. Get check out just the plain old make file. Let's rerun this. Oh, this doesn't compile now because <laughs> all the intermediate, all these variables have different names in this uh, thing. Oh, wow. Oops. Well, yeah, that didn't merge very cleanly at all now, did it? Okay. Well, let's take a quick look. And I mean quick because I don't think I'm going to be able to manually apply this patch. Um, where's my edit for this table base probing file? Here it is. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, okay, that's not so bad after all. This I can manage. I thought this was going to be a big hairy deal to try to get working. Uh, the only other thing is that this needs to be renamed to has unique pieces. Um, but I could enable all this stuff. Um, Sure, why not? And does this run? And if so, I can take all these numbers that it dumps out and try to compare what I get in my branch. Uh, move this back up the file. 
status get check make clean get status get check out syzygy stuff uh, get check out my own master branch stash apply my changes um, and we'll see that this attempts to execute and ends up with different numbers. Oh, I forget if that was standard out or standard error. I suppose we'll find out momentarily if my log files contained all that info or don't. Be a pity if they don't contain that info. But that's probably the case, because I think it was actually log logging to standard error. So, oh well. Not sure that that would help me anyway, but... Um, right, so this still fails. Uh, position 33. Um, let's see. Well, just out of curiosity. Okay, yeah, it was standard error. It's none of that debugging info printed here. Um, let me not spend too much longer here, though. Uh, whoops. Um, okay, I think that's fine. Yeah, I'll mess around with this more. Um, I don't know, if I have an abundance of free time, because I don't think I'm going to be able to figure this out. I think we finally found a problem that's too large for me to figure out. And really the only way I can solve it is by scrapping all of the variant table-based code um, in favor of the upstream repository version. That would work. That should, generally speaking, be the last resort but I don't see any other way to address all the problems that were raised um, by this upstream merge, which happened days ago, for which I've still not found an adequate solution, and which seems intractable at this point, short of just starting over. Um, it's unfortunate, but I just don't know what else to do. that all this table-based code evolved very quickly um, and I was not going to reject the initial developers contributions that he spent presumably days putting together before asking me whether I wanted it or not um, um, I forget if this was before or after it was declared that anti-chess is solved. I know people enjoy using Stockfish to solve anti-chess positions, but it's gotten to a point where I can't even maintain my own code base and accept upstream contributions without breaking everything and no amount of testing is going to fix the fact that like I can't have like completely open contributions and then no commitment to fixing the, well no is that's completely incorrect here but um, I'm putting things in absolute terms when I don't need to be I'm just saying like this has gotten to a point where standard chess table bases, table base lookups don't work anymore as a result of me doing the simplest possible merge from upstream um, and that no combination of um, preprocessor directives, no combination of enabling flags inside the makefile are able to fix 
uh, our ability to use table bases for standard chess. So because we have all this functionality for atomic chess and anti-chess and such in tbprobe.cpp, um, now we can no longer use table bases. Um, and I do contend that nothing I've done throughout this particular process of trying to make everything work, nothing I've done in the last week um, has um, in any way exacerbated this. It was just me merging code from upstream that broke this, and nothing I've changed since that upstream merge has in any way made any of this worse. This has just been uh, our code in a very brittle state, unfortunately, where if upstream decides that they're going to refactor their code, um, we're not really future-proof to that. We're not agile enough to be able to work around changes that are done upstream. And I have to keep track uh, with have to keep tracking the upstream repository. Um, so what does this mean? This means um, if I can't resolve this locally in an acceptable time frame, I need Travis to reflect the problem so that I'm not the only one who knows about it. So how do we do that? Um, well, so upstream they just worked on, um, uh, what was it, tests um, instrumented um, So they just added this ability to execute, or yeah, execute the upstream um, the, uh, English is escaping me right now. This is the execution of ZZG base code. This is us trying to use table bases in a repeatable fashion. Um, so this instrumentation code has been added um, and there's ways to manually execute this through Travis. What I'm going to do is for my repository add this to the set of things that Travis just automatically executes every time we do a build. I, I know it's a mess I know this adds a dependency for Python chess inside Travis, but um, the fact that we're not able to uh, have regression tests for um, the table based code is not good because people want to use Stockfish and have some expectation that it works. Um, so we're going to do one thing that's different than upstream, and that is allow these scripts to be executed um, without having to specify extra arguments in Travis. Because I don't know how I would go into Travis and like flip a switch and make sure that these always execute. Is there a way to do that? So I don't have to change these scripts. I don't know. Um, I sincerely doubt it, but I guess before I change any code, um, I should see if there's a way to change this somehow. Settings. Um, so, environment variables. So, Environment variables is probably what I'm looking for. Um, I'm not so familiar with how this works. Um, but if I can figure this out, we won't have to touch any code. 
Um, so let's see if command dash v val grind then do some val grind stuff um where is val grind used in any of this i scrolled up that's really not part of the same file here yeah how is it that i invoke the val grind target um Packages. This requires the Valgrind package, that's okay. Um, if command dash v Valgrind, what is command? Command is whatever invoked this, apparently. Um, I don't see any command environment variable. I'm so confused. What initializes command? Or is command a way for Travis to invoke commands? Um, I mean, I've compared this to, um, oh, what's it? I've compared this to the upstream version of this file. I haven't found anything special here. Um, hmm. I don't see how to, by default, um, request that we're going to use Travis, or use the Val grind from Travis. I don't see a way to do that. Um, this would be an excellent thing to do. I just, I don't get it. If dash x command dash v valgrind, um, well, I could try creating an environment variable, name it command, and see if that has any impact. Um, Because I'm not sure what else it would do. I'm not so familiar with how to. Well, I should search. Is there a way? Um, Stockfish Bell Grind Travis. Has anybody documented this stuff? Namely, how would you use it? How the heck do I use this? Um. Or is this just expected to be executed by default? Oh, wait, wait, wait. So, um, it looks like they said that um, Valgrind is part of Travis. But if that's the case, I should be able to reproduce this result locally using CXS flags of 01. 
Um, uh, do we even have a compilation level of 01? We don't. Um, is this problem something that only manifests itself at an 03 compilation level, but not at an 01? Um, let's see if optimize is yes, set all these flags. Um, well, um, geez. So, what are these other flags here? Oh. Right, right, right. So, okay. Make clean and test.sh. It's been forever since I've done this. Optimize, debug equals yes. Optimize equals no. Hang on. Hang on. Wait a second. Does this only happen with the debug build? I mean, no, we, of course we get a segmentation fault, even if we're not debugging, right? This is a stupid thing, but we have to test it. Um, segmentation fault still occurs, right? It doesn't care if we're doing debugging or not. If we're trying to do access memory out of bounds, of course we're going to end up with a segmentation fault. Um... Let's just verify it. It only takes a minute to verify. I mean, it's pretty obvious to me that this is going to fail. Right, we never got to position 42. So that's a segmentation fault. All right. Um, OK, so What if we turn off optimization and try this again? If we are building at an 01 build level, um, maybe we don't see the segmentation fault. I doubt it. I suspect that we still have the same problem, but you know, maybe if we're not optimizing, maybe maybe somehow things are different. No. Okay, so this is still reproducible. So why is this not reproduced from Travis? I just don't get it. Um, well, okay, can I take a look at the last build? Let's take a look at a book, Reading Rainbow. All right, so what do we have? Um, The command if val grind etc exited with zero. Um, I don't know what this means. It sure looks like nothing got executed. Um, like if I run this tests instrumented etc. Um, I should see something output, right? Um, I hear birds. Yeah, that definitely looks like output to me. All right, so um, okay. If so now I need to understand this Travis syntax. If dash x command dash v valgrind. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, make clean. Debug yes, optimize no, etc. 
test instrumented val grind. Well, yeah, nothing got printed here. I don't know this Travis syntax, although I, I expect that this is just, uh, wait, could I try this? Um, not in Travis, but just in a shell script. I expect that, um, that there's nothing special here, that there's no black magic, there's no silver bullet here. Um, but if I add this, we're not going to see it do anything special. Velgrind's not going to get invoked. I just don't know what command refers to there. Okay, well, command dot stockfish eval. How? Wait, how is command set to stockfish eval there? I'm very confused. Why did that do anything locally? That was the exact opposite of my expectations here. Um, I'm so confused. So, why the fuck does that do anything at all? Not that I even care, but let's just return that to how it used to be. Um, Travis command v val grind. Um, can anybody explain how this works? No, this is how you use Valgrind, but that's, um, Travis command V. Nope. Travis CI command. User documentation. Yeah, I just don't know what to ask anymore. Other than how the fuck does this work? <laughs> um, but, oh well. Um, I should read the documentation if I strongly, if I have strong opinions about how to use Travis. Um, I could hack something together, but, um, yeah, I just, I'm very confused why locally this evaluated to anything. Um, if dash x, I mean, this is just a shell script being executed by Travis, as best as I could tell. This is if your compiler's if, if your compiler's that, and so forth, do these things, but. I never saw an assignment to command, and I don't think command is an environment variable, but maybe it is. But it doesn't, sure doesn't look like one in everything I've ever seen about variables. I would not expect that just the word command would be a variable. Maybe it is. Maybe there's stuff I've got to learn. Setting environment variables from Travis.yml. Yarn, command not found.
Okay, that's interesting too. Apt get command not found. And s How? I'm very confused. Okay, well, I have much to learn. Um, yeah, I have much to learn about what it is that I have to learn about. To even start to understand what's going on here. Um, it's just a set of Russian nesting dolls all inside of each other. But yeah, I mean, I could experiment with adding a variable and calling it command, and I'm not even sure what I would put into it. Um, but it seems to me like that might not be something I should be specifying. I assume that command dash v is just a way of identifying what version of Valgrind is installed on the system. And if it is installed, use it. Um, and I'm assuming that despite the fact that we're requesting package Valgrind to be installed, somehow it's just not there. That's my expectation. Well, okay, to try to learn more about this, there is one more data point I could look at, and that's what does upstream do? When upstream does a build, um, we're able to look at the build log and introspect what happened. So I can go here and see, um, oh, what? Okay, here it is. Exited with zero. Again, there's no anything getting printed here. Um, and it completed in 0.01 seconds. So I'm assuming that Valgrind is not something that they routinely enable. Um, and I'm guessing that I don't get to see what the environment variables are because I don't see where I would see that. Um, but if I go through the build history, I should be able to see um, integrate ZZG and automated testing. There's our commit in GitHub. Um, I don't see any increase in build times. And yet this was just, I'm confused. So this successfully built um, but did not uh, increase the time it takes to execute this script. Um, okay, so maybe it is maybe just the GCC7 build that's capable of printing out this Valgrind stuff. Um, let me take a look at that. Maybe if I'm using GCC7, I should be able to observe the same results. If not in this build, at least in the, um... Oh, here we go. Yeah, GCC7, this particular machine, uh, did install Valgrind. And what do we have? Depth 10. Um, this is even the latest build, isn't it? Um, so that's cool. Now, how, how did this not error out? Instrumented testing OK. All right. Um, so what was my command here? Instrumented testing OK is our result. This is what got executed. 
Um, and I think that's, yeah. So I should either get the words instrumented testing okay, or I should get something else. Um, and this is, there's no need to set any variables. I just got taken down in a rabbit hole because I just don't know what I was talking about. Um, All right, so prior to all of this, um, I should do that. And really, in this case, that kind of, well, okay. Hang on, so building, okay, for x86 64-bit, not BMI2. Yeah, let's just, disable this make build entirely and just use that instead. Make clean. Test this using all the same parameters that are used by Travis. Um, I assume that not using BMI2 is going to have no change, but maybe something else about how that's invoked causes some kind of change, but we should see at the end of this either instrumented testing okay or that instrumented testing is not okay. One of those two outcomes should occur here. Stockfish go nodes 1000. Okay, well it's pretty cool that we get to see all these test tools are integrated with each other. Um, no leaks are possible. No leaks are possible. That's nice. At least I haven't introduced a memory leak. Man, those folks upstream must take this stuff pretty seriously. Okay. And stockfish go with x time per player remaining on the clock. And x increment per player. Um, but that really only goes for a single position. But we're just trying to test that the benchmark uh, works for all these positions, I guess. I would not expect this to advance beyond position 40 or 33. It's unfortunate that it takes seconds per position, at least for our attempting to demonstrate anything instructive here. Um, but yeah, I won't torture you with having to watch through all this. Just know that I figured out how to execute the same test locally. If there is no problem exercised, then I can try to figure out how to change Travis to be able to exercise the problem. If there is a problem exercised locally, then I'm just screwed and I just figure out how to force Travis to exercise the same problem might be more difficult. Um, we'll figure it out one way or another, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I guess if I can't reproduce this, then I have to cry for help and ask, like, why is my machine see different results than the Travis server? Somebody would know. But if I can reproduce things locally, I should try to augment the Travis test um, until it produces an error. Or rather, I should try augment this test script I've got, produce the error, and then change Travis.yml to have the same uh, use case exercised. Either way, it's been a trip. Thanks for watching. And yeah, hopefully we'll do more games in the future, because this stuff is 
way out there. It's too much for any of us. Alright, see you next time. Have a good night.